Welcome back to Ostrich Investing. In our first two videos, we looked at some very well-known large cap stocks, Starbucks, Enbridge. Today, we're gonna look at a lesser known company called ZCL Composites. Trades on the TSX under the symbol ZCL, which makes a lot of sense. And they are North America's largest manufacturer of fiberglass reinforced plastic underground storage tanks, which is a long-winded way of explaining and describing uh, the picture that you see on the screen right now. And these tanks are largely used in, in gas stations. So underneath a gas stations where the fuel is stored. Uh, they're designed to be corrosion resistant and avoid environmental contamination. So if we look at the stock chart, and one of the reasons why I thought this would be an interesting company to explore and review, um, you know, this stock really went on a run. This is a five year chart. And if you go back to 2016, it really started to ramp up from the six to seven dollar range up, reached about as high as fifteen dollars in mid 2017. But it's since pulled back fairly materially and is now trading at about seven dollars and eighty cents. Uh, there's a 54 cent dividend, which works out to about 7% yield based on today's prices. Um, so I was curious to take a look and see if there's an opportunity. This video is going to look at the uh, financial overview, the recent news and results, discussion on valuation, and then we'll conclude with key considerations for the stock. So let's jump into it. So we're going to start with the annual report and we're going to start uh, with the financial overview which I believe is on page 13. Let me just jump there. There we go. So we can see revenues in 2015 were 165 million jumping up to 184 million in 2016 and that works out to be about 11 percent growth and then 2017 revenue crept just a little bit higher but fairly flat at 180. 8 million. Pretty clean financials here actually if you go down there you, big contrast to running through Enbridge statements um, pretty clean here your revenue to your gross profit down to your net income uh, fairly clean not too many items actually if we jump down they give you a couple of the balance sheet items and we can see that this business actually has net cash uh, they had 40 million of cash in 2015, 43 in 2016. It's gone down a little bit now to 25 million at the end of 2017. And probably a lot of that has to do with paying out some fairly hefty dividends. But you can see there's no debt, no long-term debt on the business. Um, and I think the last thing I'll mention when it comes to the financial overview is the company has guided to what they call the 10-10-10 um, growth strategy um, and what what they mean by that is 10% revenue growth 10% profit growth and 10% dividend growth over the long term and um, you know I think their view is that if they can hit that while this is never going to be a high-tech uber growth stock um, you know if you can get 10% growth on the top line 10% growth on the bottom line and 10% dividend growth that's a fairly attractive investment vehicle. So that's the overview of the stock. You can actually just quickly highlight net income here uh, from continuing operations. Fairly stable, actually. 17.5 million to 20 million, back down to about 18.5. So fairly stable profitability here over the last couple of years. We'll jump into a detailed review now and just get a little bit further down into the, into the annual report. I will go to uh, the statements first. So here's your consolidated balance sheet. And what I want to first talk about is on the income statement and it has to do with margins. So you can see their income statement is fairly, uh, fairly clean. Most of the costs are in the manufacturing and selling costs. There isn't really much in the way of other fixed costs. You can see that there's a small GNA line, uh, relatively small anyway, of about $10 million. So I was curious to look at this note six here. 
and see what's actually in the cogs, the cost of goods sold. So we'll jump to page 46. We go down, there it is. So you can see they've got two items that I'd expect to see here, uh, raw materials and consumables and the direct labor costs. But there's another item here called other costs and it's fairly meaningful, it's $53 million. And what I think the company's done here is fairly smart. I mean, they're a publicly traded company with really, for the most part, one product. And um, all of their customers can see their financials. Um, and I think what they're trying to do is disguise their gross margin a little bit by putting in some more fixed type costs up into um, the cost of goods sold so that their gross margins show a little bit lower than they might otherwise be. That That's my guess. Um, but there's $53 million of other costs that, you know, we don't have a good description really of what's included in that. But given how lean everything else is, I'd imagine there's, there's a fair amount of those costs that are actually fixed in nature. So I just wanted to point that out. What else did I want to point out on the detailed review? Let's go back up to the strong uh, balance sheet. Let me just point that out here. So here we go. So you can see the cash position, which was highlighted in the overview. If we go down to the liabilities section, there's really no, no debt. They do have some provisions probably related to warranties on their product, um, but really very, very clean balance sheet here. Um, just some accounts payable, some dividends payable. Um, and then you can go down and look at the book value of the equity. And we'll actually take a look at this when we get to the valuation sec section, but company generated a return on equity of about 17% um, in 2017 based on this book value of equity. And that's something we'll take a look at when we when we value the stock. And the last thing that I wanted to point out in our detailed review, it relates to some of the market and industry information. And so for this, we're actually going to go to the annual information form, which is a document that um, was not available on the company's website, but is available on CDAR, which um, for Canadian listed companies, that is where all of the public filings are located. So we'll jump over to CDAR uh, quickly here and we'll pull up the annual, there's CDAR here, and we'll pull up the annual information form, the most recent. So you can see all of the filings here. And here we go, there's the annual. Boom. And there we are. So this document tends to give a general description of the business, the industry, some of their competitors, uh, and gives a bit of a chronological history as well. So what I wanted to take us to is on page nine, there's a discussion about some of the environmental and market trends. Um, and they talk about their competitive advantage. This is a really uh, good document to check in on, particularly when you're looking at a company that's in a niche industry, you're trying to understand it. So they talk about a competitive advantage for ZCL is the superior corrosion resistant properties of its FRP tanks, so the fiberglass tanks. Some operators of fuel storage systems in North America still use steel tanks, the product that dominated the downstream storage tank market prior to the introduction of FRP tanks in the 1970s. Many of these steel tanks may need to be upgraded or replaced to permit the safe storage in current future fuels. So I think one of the key reasons why revenue growth, uh, historically, if we go back several, several years beyond the three that we just looked at, has been quite strong is, is this replacement cycle where older gas station or stations are replacing legacy steel tanks with a new, newer, more corrosive resistant fiberglass tank. Another important environmental trend that benefits ZCL is the ongoing regulatory concern over the potential contamination of groundwater from leaking underground fuel storage tanks. So this comes to the environmental risk. This concern has led regulators to mandate secondary containment for the storage of most hazardous liquids, including motor, fu motor fuels. 
Current regulations in all states require that all new underground storage tanks, USTs, being installed shall have a secondary containment, which generally means a double wall tank. And so they've got a product for this as well. So even you've got a regulatory push here that requires gas stations to have certain products have double walled storage tanks, and that's driving um, some of their, their revenue and revenue growth historically. So I just wanted to point that out and, and point that out in this, uh, in this document, the annual information form. So then let's check in on how they've been performing recently. So we'll jump back. I think I've got their Q2 up here. So here's their Q2 release, uh, which just came out a week or two ago. Um, there's a couple things I want to talk about here. So the first is revenue. And we'll go to page nine. So if you look at their financial data, they actually didn't report a great Q2. You can see here, uh, revenue was down um, year over year, 47 million compared to 53 um, in the previous period. And same if you look at the six month versus the previous six month period. So revenue is down um, and margins are also down. 22% down to 18%. So that's a fairly material move in, in margins. And even if you look at the six month period, 17% from 21. So revenues down, margins down, you guessed it. Uh, profitability thus is gonna be down. So if we look at the outlook um, that the company gives, and I believe that's on page seven, So they explicitly come out and say, we expect revenue to be comparable to 2017. So they think that they can catch up a little bit on the revenue in the back half of the year, but you know, expect revenue to be flat at 2017 levels. But they do, they talk about profitability here. For the 2018 year, they do expect lower profitability relative to 2017. And they talk about some of the reasons for Margins being down and profitability being down relate to number one, uh, resin prices, which is a uh, key input cost, and that's gone up faster than they've been able to raise prices. And, and they've also been in investing in the business. And often there's a lag between those investments being made and they're being expensed in the P&L and actually showing up in terms of revenue growth and profit growth. So those are a couple of things that they point out. Another point I want to make, and this goes back to Q1, and I'll just pull this up quickly. Um, I find Seeking Alpha does a great job at, um, at including conference call transcripts for, for many publicly traded companies. So I always like to check here. Listening to the calls is, is a great option, but I like having it in text form if I can. It allows you to sort of go back and, and look at some of the answers and gives you a pretty quick searchable way to review it. One of the, we won't go through this here, but Q1, one of the big takeaways is they had launched a strategic review, which, which oftentimes can lead to a sale of the business. And at Q1, um, they announced essentially that the strategic review had been completed and there were no transactions. So it's going to be continue with the status quo um, and and just continue to grow the business organically and maybe look for acquisition opportunities. What I find interesting about this is, is number one, they, they ran a strategic review process, so they were considering selling the business. And then number two, if you go back to the share price, um, that strategic review would have been happening with a share price much higher than current levels, probably in the $12 range. And so the CEO alludes on the Q1 conference call to the fact that they couldn't, they had many discussions with both strategic and financial buyers, but could not reach an agreement on price. He alluded to that um, in the Q&A uh, session. So 
now that the share price is down at, at close, you know, even below $8 a share, I wonder if there's an opportunity to revisit those discussions um, and maybe there's a deal to be had here. So just food for thought. And then the last point on the recent update is, and we'll just jump back to the update here. And this is on page five. So we have a new president and chief executive officer. Um, the outgoing CEO, Ron uh, Bachmeyer, I hope I didn't butcher his last name. He's been with the business for 30 years and uh, has been the CEO for, for many. And he's agreed to provide transition for the business through 2019, but obviously there's a, there's management transition risk here. Um, they give you background. The, the person that they brought in um, is Ted Redmond, and he has eight years plus um, experience as CEO of uh, an energy service services business most recently. And what again I find interesting is that they point out um, here in their release that Mr. Redmond has participated in over 15 M&A transactions, led organic growth initiatives, and has Im implemented rigorous process improvements leading to higher margins. So they talk about, they they identify his experience in M&A. So now whether that is leading towards a potential M&A transaction to grow the business or an M&A transaction that might be uh, the sale of ZCL itself, time will tell. But we've got a new CEO coming in uh, as of, I believe it's, yeah, effective September 10th. So that's what I wanted to cover off on uh, the recent update. Now if we look at uh, valuation, and we'll just jump back to the stock chart to have it up here. So last year the company did about 60 cents a share in earnings per share. This year, as we saw from the Q2 release, profits expected to be down. Uh, management's guide guided to reduce profitability, but they haven't quantified it. So unlike some of the larger companies that will give guidance, that's not the case here. Um, you know, based on my quick back of the napkin math, and it, it could be off, I didn't spend much time on this because I, I really want to just show the ranges and, and how that'll affect uh, the prices. but with flat revenue which is what they've guided to but margins lower let's suggest that maybe their eps is going to come in at 45 cents to 50 cents a share we'll use 50 just because it's a round number and uh, and ultimately it's not going to have a huge impact on our illustrative scenarios at this point um, so 50 cents a share of earnings one thing to remember their dividend is 54 cents a share so Yes, it's a nice 7% yield, but um, you know, from an earnings perspective and a dividend payout ratio, they're gonna be through 100% this year, most likely. Now, price to earnings is one way of looking at the stock, and if we use 50 cents a share, uh, based on their current share price of about $7.80, that works out to be a PE of 15 and a half times. But I think, particularly again here where there's no debt on the balance sheet, we should look at it from a leverage neutral perspective. So EV to EBITDA is another metric commonly used, and we'll take a look at, uh, at that perspective. Uh, the enterprise value here is about 240 million. It's the market cap of the stock, um, plus the debt. And in this case, they have actually um, spent through their cash that was there at the end of 2017 and they have drawn down one million dollars on their uh, line of credit so 240 million dollar market cap plus one million dollars of debt gets us to 241 million of ev and ebitda last year was 31 million again we would expect this to be down this year what does that ultimately look like? I've just earmarked 25 million. So 241 million of EV divided by 25 million of EBITDA is pretty close to 10 times. So it's trading right now at 9.6 times EV to EBITDA. Now, um, 
one last point I'll make, the company was was doing 31, 32 million of EBITDA historically. Um, and so assuming that EBITDA was growing, you know, you could make the argument, you could say, this is getting close to a $35 million EBITDA business, in which case um, the EV to EBITDA multiple comes down to 6.9 times and starts to look a lot more reasonable. So, you know, our 25 million is just based on us haircutting the EBITDA based on management management's guidance in Q2. Um, but that's going to move the needle a lot on this multiple. And the last thing that I wanted to point out, um, again, was the return on equity uh, relative to the price to book. So I will just pull up the financial overview again. Page 13. Here we are. Did they give us the book value? Of course, they do not. Here we go. Okay. Uh, so, like I, I said earlier, 111 million of book value of equity company generated profits that um, work out to about a 17% return on equity, which is fairly attractive. Um, the stock trades at about 2.4 times price to book, 240 million market cap divided by, as of the latest Q2, book value of equities dropped to about 100 million. So trades at about 2.4 times price to book versus an ROE of 17%. Um, so we also need, you know, need to remember the business is fully unlevered so we have to factor that in. On the surface, if I just saw those metrics, I'd say that this business has a really nice return on equity, but the valuation, I would wanna see that valuation in one, one and a half times um, uh, to make the math work. So here, it's trading at a valuation that's significantly higher than that on a price to book basis, but um, we have to remember the business has no debt on it. So there's probably an optimal capital structure here that we wanna look at. And um, as we mentioned before, the dividend of 54 cents a share, it's about 7% yield based on current prices. So, you know, it, it's close to all of their earnings or a little bit more than all of their earnings to pay out that dividend. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect dividend growth here in the near term, maybe in the medium term as they get back to their 10, 10, 10 revenue growth, profit growth and dividend growth. But I, I wouldn't be buying the stock expecting dividend growth in the near term. So lastly, we will um, wrap it all up and look at our key considerations and then our bull, bear, and base case scenario. So key considerations for this stock after doing some research. Uh, strengths, obviously, they've got a, a really strong balance sheet, no debt. I, I stand corrected. They have $1 million worth of debt. Um, attractive ROE 17% in 2017 so they've got a nice profitable model lean business um, strong balance sheet and then the last point is their market leader with with a long-term track record um, one point that they did make in their annual information form which I didn't show you here is they talked about having a market share of 50 plus percent maybe close to um, yeah I think between 50 and 70 percent of the fiberglass tanks being sold. So they're clearly a leader in what they do, um, and which is usually a really good thing. A nice, They must have nice competitive advantage. Clearly the fiberglass storage tanks are, are um, uh, better than steel, but um, it, they must be better than many of their competitors as well, uh, just based on that market share data. Risks, new CEO announced recently, um, and so there's some management transition risk there, particularly when the uh, outgoing CEO had been with the company for so long, so just wanna point that out. Also, the replacement cycle for fuel storage tanks. I mean, these steel tanks were, uh, were used historically, we're talking decades ago, and so what inning are we in here on the replacement cycle? Do are we in the you know mid innings? We're definitely not in the early innings. 
are we in the mid innings and there's still there's a long way to go and there's going to be lots of business lots of new business for for um for zcl or are we closer to the late to the late innings because the replacement cycle for these tanks i mean these tanks tend to last for quite a long time so if you think about putting a new tank into a gas station or several new tanks into a gas station it's going to be many years before they're going to be calling you back for a replacement tank um, and then obviously a key risk here as we saw in the q2 results is um, is the profitability dip in 2018 and so again looking back over several years the backlog had been growing revenue had been growing <clears throat> q2 results showed a drop off in revenue and i think the markets worried or concerned that you know, maybe 2017 results are our peak peak revenue and profitability. Um, and so we'll have to see how that plays out. We'll have to track it going forward. And lastly, key drivers. Ability to grow beyond the niche market. The company's been trying to do this for years. Um, and particularly in the water treatment um, area. Um, similar to the fuel market where they believe that their fiberglass tanks are vastly superior to steel steel tanks which i think everyone would agree to now they also believe that uh, traditional concrete tanks used in water treatment um, can be displaced by uh, their fiberglass product now they haven't had much traction on that to date so time will tell but they've been talking about this for quite a while now and haven't really showed much traction. So I think they estimate it's a fairly sizable opportunity of 400 to $600 million industry annually, but a little bit skeptical as to whether they're actually gonna be able to deliver there just based on how long they've been talking about it and how, um, how small the revenue and the results that they've been able to generate from that side of the business. I skipped over the second key driver, which is the fuel market growth. Again, we talked about it in the risk section, um, gas stations, replacement cycle. So what I mean by gas stations there, are, you know, with electric vehicles over the next decade or two, are the number of gas stations going to continue to shrink? What does that look like? Obviously, that's going to be a driver for the business. And then the last point I, I, I talked about a little bit, um, I hinted at it private equity backstop or a sale to a strategic. We know that they went through a strategic review. Um, they did just go out and hire a new CEO, so it would be a little bit surprising if they were to immediately uh, re-engage in those discussions. But um, in the back of our minds, we have to know that they were going through that strategic review while the share price was significantly higher than it was today, over 50% higher, sort of in that $12 range. And now it's sitting down at, at $8 a share. So while um, they might not have been able to come to an agreement on valuation back when the share was the share price was $12 a share, um, if we're able to get in at $8, that might uh, give us a fair amount of downside protection that there could be a buyer here uh, at a meaningful premium to the current price. So those are the key considerations. And let's look at the illustrative scenarios for discussion. As always, the, these are, as, as it says, just illustrative, um, just to show a bull case, a base case, and, and a bear case for the stock uh, based on some of the key drivers that we've discussed. So we'll start with the bull case. And I think really the bull case here is, is, is exactly that. It's a sale of the company to a private equity or a strategic buyer. So based on our entry point here, which would be around the $8 per share, um, if they were able to sell the business at 10 times EBITDA and, and EBITDA of 35 million, um, as opposed to 25 million, that would get us to an enterprise value of 350 million, which uh, works out to about 11.50 a share. So if you're buying in today at $8 a share, that's almost 50% upside plus you're clipping a 7% um, dividend coupon while you while you wait. So not bad. Um, now, what's the likelihood of that scenario? That's, that's another discussion. Base case, uh, we've got the new CEO in. Let's assume that the fuel market remains stable, i.e. we're in mid innings on the replacement cycle. 
margins return to previous levels so they're able to put through some price increases um, to pass along some of the input cost uh, increases that they've seen um, water treatment does not gain traction so again that new business segment that they're trying to develop i just haven't seen enough there to include in our bear case that this in our base case sorry that this actually does gain traction so we've sort of left that out um, but the fuel market business continues to remain stable and margins return to previous levels let's assume there that they get their ebitda back to that 35 million dollar uh, level and we'll put an eight times multiple on it that implies a share price of nine dollars a share so nine dollars a share upside of a little little over a dollar a share plus the dividend of uh, 54 cents a year and in a case where they get their EBITDA back to 35 million um, that should cascade down to to earnings per share that will cover that will cover that dividend so that's your that's your base case scenario and then lastly the bear case is um, is not pretty um, the bear case contemplates that we are at, in fact, in the late innings of the fuel tank replacement cycle. And so you are going to see the order backlog come off and and subsequently revenues come off. So declining revenue and earnings. In this case, anytime you've got declining earnings and revenue, your, your multiple is going to come off considerably. So let's suggest we value the business at six times EBITDA of $25 million. That actually works out to a share price of, of $5 a share. So based on today's share price of about $8, that's $3 uh, downside, um, close to 50% downside. You are getting paid that 7% dividend while you wait, so and it could offset some of your losses there. But I think that's the key thing to explore on the bear side is making sure we're not in the late innings of this fuel tank replacement cycle. So let me know what you think. Uh, which, scenario, which scenario is most likely? Have I missed anything? Or do you have a different take? Um, that's a wrap on our video for ZCL. Check us out at ostrichinvesting.com or on Twitter at ostrich underscore invest. We'll be back soon with more content, but until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand.